Tonight's uh, speaker, Chuck Adams, and the Hopi tribe uh, have a deep, uh, long-term relationship. Uh, Chuck has worked up there uh, since time immemorial, I believe. <clears throat> there you go. Chuck's going to be talking about ethnoarchaeology and his work at Hopi, and I will let him uh, explain uh, the work he's been doing, and uh, I will give him the stage here, and I hope you'll enjoy very much uh, tonight's speaker. I enjoyed the write-up, and uh, it's yeah. all yours, Chuck. Thanks, Bill. You hear me okay? Is this working okay? All right. Um, well, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, mostly a uh, new group of people. You know, when you're in Tucson and you give enough presentations, you start feeling like you know everybody in the audience already. And uh, uh, so it's always nice to get out and, and meet uh, and new people. And I hope uh, you'll have some questions for me afterwards. Um, I brought along a, uh, a volume that I produced that um, summarizes the work I'm going to talk about a little bit this evening um, that uh, will be available if anybody wants to flip through it afterwards. Um, it, they, they only made 25 copies of this. So um, I actually went on to Amazon once to see and there was a, pilot, a pirated copy of it on there. It was going for $200, so don't spill any sauce or anything on this when you look around. Um, so um, I, wanna, I'm, I really appreciate um, Bill and Linda asking me to talk about uh, this topic that um, I'm going to discuss tonight uh, it, cause, because it goes back in some ways, almost to the roots of uh, when I got started in archaeology. Um, I, uh, I received my PhD from the University of Colorado in Boulder in 1975. Uh, I was 11 years old at the time. Uh, very young uh, prodigy. Um, and, but the first thing I did after getting my PhD was uh, I was uh, fortunate enough to be hired by the Museum of Northern Arizona, which hopefully most of you have visited. If you haven't, I highly recommend it, up in Flagstaff, um, to work on a project uh, which involved doing the archaeological excavations and analysis of a living Hopi village. Uh, the village of Walpi, and uh, there's some handouts up there. Hopefully everybody, at least a couple of them at the tables, uh, the maps, one of them is of the village of Walpi as it looked in 1975, and the other one is where Walpi is located on the Hopi Mesas. Um, the reason that the work needed to be done at Walpi was uh, because the village was basically falling down. Uh, and a fortunate um, happenstance occurred. The uh, tribe had invited the uh, Secretary of the Interior, Rogers Morton at the time, appointed by Gerald Ford, if you can believe that far back, uh, to come out and visit the tribes in Arizona, and so when we went to First Mesa at Walpi, they told him about the terrible condition of the village that was falling down, and they couldn't get anybody to build it, rebuild it. They used to rebuild these things themselves, but that wasn't possible anymore because all the young people were either too lazy or they had their own jobs, which, you know, is a common lament of older people, <laughs> and darn lazy younger generation. Um, so the... Uh, Rogers Morton said, well, the Park Service will be glad to help you out with that. Um, because uh, part of the, the situation was that Walpi is a historic, it's on the National Register of Historic Places. The National Park Service has a ruined stabilization unit where they rebuild, they repair um, uh, ruins primarily f throughout the Southwest. And so he thought they would be perfect to come out and work on this. Uh, the Park Service came out and said, boy, yeah, this really needs some work and we can't do it for you, sorry. So, um, so the um, 
uh, Morton got $250,000 allocated to, to do some work on this, and they hired some people from the Bureau of Indian Affairs to start doing the stabilization work. The reason I was hired is because um, I actually had gone through a ruined stabilization course in, at the University of Colorado for a couple of summers. And um, I had worked at the Museum in Northern Arizona a few years earlier, so they knew, knew who I was. Uh, but I'd been to the Hopi Mesas once in my life. Um, but the opportunity to uh, work in a community where the people still occupy it, who I could converse with about the archaeological record, the, the, the living record there, uh, to find out about objects I've always been curious about that I've found as an archaeologist, and I could just say, what is this? To, to Hopi people. Those are all the things that went through my mind as I, I offered to, to take on this project. And uh, fortunately for me, they, um, they accepted that. And there was $60,000 that was allocated for the archeology. span We were in the field for 18 straight months. Um, if any of you have done archeology, span try to imagine doing it for 18 straight months. Uh, we started in November of, two th of 1975, and we finished in April of 1977. So we did two winters up at 6,200 feet when it gets below zero doing uh, stabilization work in archaeology. So um, it was worth it, but boy, there were some times I was really, really cold out there. <laughs> the wind was blowing, and it was about 15 degrees, and I was thinking, gosh, you know, maybe I should have taken that desk job. Um, so, um, so what I did up there is what is uh, referred to as ethnoarchaeology. Um, does anybody know what that means? Anybody want to hazard a guess about what that means? Some of you pro should know, may know. I won't call anybody. Yeah. So did you hear that? It's a, a combination of the archaeology through the eyes of the people who live it. Um, that's partly, partly it, uh, it, it, but it's from my, my perspective asking those people about the archaeological records. So uh, the, the, the ir irony is the reason that archaeologists are doing ethnographic work. So what this means is we're doing ethnographic work. We're going out and we're studying living people. The reason archaeologists are doing it because social cultural anthropologists aren't really interested in material culture. They're interested in marriage patterns and you know, uh, lineages. They're interested in all the social aspects of it, which is important. But for about the last 50 to 75 years, nobody's really looked at the material culture very much. So what, as, what archaeologists do is we, we're interested, or I'm interested, and ethnoarchaeologists are interested in, in the sort of the ethnography of material culture and, <laughs> and its social setting. That's, that's the way I would define ethnoarchaeology. So we're focused on objects and how people use objects and how they interact with other people uh, with those objects, uh, whether it would be uh, an, an outfit for a ceremonial dance or outfits for marriages or how they grind corn or things like that. How are these objects that are left in the material archaeological record, how are they actually being used by people? Because a lot of things we just guess at, uh, a lot of things we don't really know. So, uh, so this, I felt, was an opportunity to uh, grill those poor Hopi about what it is that they, they do. So uh, let me tell you a little bit about Walpi, and you have a map there. Um, Walpi is on First Mesa. How many, anybody? People been on tours at Walpi? Great, good. So most, many of you know what it looks like. Uh, if you've seen a postcard of a Hopi village, it's probably Walpi, uh, taken about 1900. Um, you know, it's, it sits on a narrow finger of rock. Uh, the rock that, that it sits on is probably maybe 100 feet wide at its widest. Um, Walpi was established about 1690. And um, it was uh, established at that time because they were concerned about Spanish 
reprisals. Anybody know what, why they were concerned about Spanish reprisals in 1690? Pueblo, the Pueblo Revolt of 1680. Great, yes. So in 1680, the greatest revolution that probably has happened in the Southwest occurred when all the Pueblo people in New Mexico and Arizona got together and basically overthrew the Spanish government and all of the missionaries that were in Pueblo villages. Uh, and they drove them out of New Mexico, what's today New Mexico and Arizona, down toward El Paso. There were three missionaries on the Hopi Mesas in 1680, three missions, I should say, five missionaries. Um, all those missionaries were killed. Um, the, the missions were destroyed to some degree. Um, Walpi was kind of an insignificant village in 1680. It, it didn't even merit a mission. It had a visita, which is where the missionary would come and visit weekly or periodically. And, and they came from a very large village called Wadavi, uh, about 15 miles away from Walpi, which w will be on your map. So, um, but after the revolt, uh, the Hopi realized, and probably all Pueblo realized, you know, the Spaniards are going to come back eventually. And they're not going to be happy. They're, going to be, they're not going to be happy, and they're going to express that in very aggressive ways, probably. So the Hopi people made the decision, all of, all of the communities that were living sort of down below in vulnerable areas, opted to move up to places like Walpi today, where it's pretty inaccessible. It's easy to defend up there. And... Um, we estimated that that took place sometime after 1680. We actually got tree ring dates from the work that I, I supervised up there, suggesting it occurred around 1690, 1688 to 1692. The Spaniards returned in 1692, more or less permanently. So uh, that might have spurred the, the actual decision to move up there. Uh, at the, in the Founding of Walpi up until about the mid-1800s, it probably had about 600 rooms. Uh, so it was, again, a, a, for those, that time in that area, that was a fairly small village. All the other villages at, at the Hopi Mesas, the other three main ones, uh, had well over 1,000 rooms. You may know Araibi is kind of the most famous third Mesa village. It had over 1,000 rooms, over 1,000 people in it. So Walpi was on the smaller side. Um, and um, in 1975, there were maybe 150 rooms left. Uh, it had been dismantled, it had fallen down, it had been uh, abused. And uh, the reason the Hopi were so, the First Mesa Hopi were so invested in keeping Walpi is because it is what's called a mother village or the primary village at Hopi, which means it's where all the major ceremonial uh, the ceremonies take place and all the ceremonial objects are stored and the main kivas, the ceremonial structures for First Mesa, are in the village of Walpi. And so that was what they wanted to preserve. They, 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 did, they told the Rogers Morton and the National Park Service and whoever else in the government wanted to hear, that, oh yeah, we plan to move into these rooms when you rebuild them. That really wasn't what their interest was. Their interest was in preserving the ceremonial structures and access to those for future generations. Um, so uh, I was hired on as the, um, the annoying archeologist who had kept the, uh, the BIA people in, in line about what they could and could not do with historic structures. Um, I documented the entire project with photography. Yes, photography was allowed by me up there um, in the 1970s. Um, I did drawings and sketches of every room that we um, worked in, which was about uh, almost 100 rooms. And the really great thing about that is I got to interview the people who actually owned those rooms or knew people who owned those rooms. So I got to find out in the rooms that we worked in who those people were, what clans they belonged to, what the room was used for, when it was built, when it was torn down or, or stopped being lived in, all those things that archaeologists love to know about and we can only guess at. 
So that was a, re a really great opportunity. Uh, the way that we worked the project is that we had, I, I worked with, uh, we worked with the religious leaders of the community. And um, the, relig the religious leaders in general um, represent a clan or a, a, a grouping of clans. And so the, the community was divided into groups of, of clan owned structures. And so when, whatever area of Walpi we were working in, we would talk to the, the, the clan leader and the religious leader of that area and whoever community members might be interested in it to find out what their priorities were for doing work in that area and to, to ask them to remove anything from those structures that they didn't want basically taken by the archaeologist and stuck in a museum or discarded in some cases. Um, so we, um, we had the opportunity then to, to talk to those religious leaders about you know, what activities were going on in these areas uh, and they identified uh, ceremonial structures and things like that that we needed to be particularly careful in going into. Um, the, um, the crew that worked on this project was an entirely Hopi crew, all from First Mesa, of course, um, and all from Hope, the Hopi villages. The, there are three villages on First Mesa, two Hopi villages and one uh, Tewa village, which is a Pueblo people that came from the Galisteo Basin in 1696 and established a village on, to the uh, north of Walpi uh, because they are not Hopi uh, in the eyes of the Hopi and in the eyes of the Tewa, I suppose, too. They were not allowed to go into that because there were Hopi ceremonial objects and things that they, they did not want the Tewa to know about or to see where these things were. So, so it was people from uh, Walpi and the next village, Satomavi. When I started work there, um, I was assigned two Hopi uh, assistants. And the, the Hopi assistants were to help me do, when, I did, when we did excavations and things like that. They helped remove, w remove the material um, and screen it. Uh, but they were also there to keep an eye on me. Um, because, you know, they don't know me from anybody and um, they're a little suspicious that I'm crawling around in these rooms, finding stuff and maybe pocketing it and selling it, you know. Uh, so they, for the first couple of months of the 18 months, they kept a very close eye on me. Um, so we had to do a couple of things to gain the community's trust. The most important thing in a project like this is to work with the community and to gain their trust and, uh, and to, to educate them about what we're doing. So we did a couple of, uh, couple of things. Uh, I should mention that uh, we, actually, we lived uh, in a trailer below First Mesa, a wonderful 24-foot Airstream trailer. That was also our lab. So everything that was excavated in the village was brought down to this lab and we Wa washed it, cleaned it, cataloged it, organized it. And what we did with that was to, um, first of all, the religious leaders and the crew looked at the artifacts that we found. We found something kind of odd, and that was another reason to have a Hopi helper, because they could identify things, believe me, that I would never have guessed had some ceremonial purpose. Things that, you know, I won't describe any to you, but uh, because that would not be appropriate, but uh, things that look pretty ordinary, but they were not that way at all. Um, so what we did is after, after carefully looking through these objects with the religious leaders and with the Hopi crew, um, we had um, monthly community events where we brought everything out from an area that we'd worked in, all the artifacts, and we put them in, we did this in the community center at First Mesa and invited the entire community to come down and see what we'd been finding. And the purpose for that was to meet the community so they could see who we were and to make, you know, that we were um, okay. And also to, um, 
allay their fears that we were taking things and, you know, to the museum and Flagstaff stealing things, because they were very concerned that we were going to steal things initially and, and put them in a museum or, or take them away from the First Mesa community. Um, but the other thing was is to uh, lay things out so people could see some, the history of their village uh, and also to help us identify things that we had no idea what they were, uh, which were quite a few things. And then we also had things that we absolutely knew what they were, but we were wrong. <laughs> As archaeologists, we were just wrong. So one example of that is, uh, you know what monos are? You know, these grinding stones. Well, we had various kinds of monos that we had laid out, and we had some that were really shiny and, and, and had a different sheen to them. And we were very curious about those, um, but we, they looked like monos. So we talked to some of the uh, ladies in the village about these, and they said, no, those aren't, those aren't monos. Um, those are hide processing stones. Um, and in some, in some cases, they were floor polishing stones. And, and they used the stones to remove the hair uh, and other debris, rem remnants of deer uh, from hides and to smooth them and, and, and work them so that they could become leather. And as a result, these things, because of the oils in the hides, these things became just brilliantly shiny and polished. And they were the same structure as a mono. Uh, and so we began to realize that, you know, uh, um, there's a lot that we just are assuming about the archaeology that, that we're uh, totally wrong about. Uh, another thing that was really great about these uh, little show and tell events is there were things that were found by, um, in one case, uh, men were men are weavers in the Hopi community, uh, un unlike many communities where women are the weavers. Men are the weavers. And, they f and we found, uh, I should mention, um, virtually every structure we worked in was an intact structure. It had a roof and everything to it. So it was like working in a dry cave. Everything's preserved in these rooms. 89% um, of the material that we found was perishable material. So that means that in an archaeological site, we are finding about 10 to 15 percent of the material culture of any, of a group, a Pueblo group. That, so that's a big loss. We're, we're losing a lot of the archaeological record. So that's sobering. Um, and one of the things that we found a lot of were textiles. Um, uh, sashes and kilts and, and mantas, which are the women's uh, uh, dresses and all those sorts of things. And uh, some of the sashes we found, the, uh, the Hopi weavers, a couple of whom worked on the project, said, well, those aren't Hopi. You know, th those are not Hopi sashes. And we, and we said, well, uh, why not? He said, because they're woven in a way that no Hopi weaves sashes today. So we look at the context of where it came from, and, um, and, and we were pretty sure that this was not from another, you know, wasn't for, traded in from Navajos or whatever. Uh, we were pretty sure this was probably a Hopi, Hopi weaving. And what was really great about it is that the weavers got together and they talked about it, and then they talked about, uh, talked to some of their, their elders, and then they pulled out some of the old stuff that they hadn't used for a long time. That they had been using weaving techniques 150 years ago that had died out. And so these, these weavers in the 1970s borrowed these kilts and sashes so they could relearn how to weave in a way that they had lost. So that was a really great thing. So in that way, we could begin giving back to the community. They could learn about their past. They could, then they began to tell stories about, oh, my grandmother you know, used to wear something like that, or they, they use this artifact in some way, and they begin to tell stories and remember people and things like that, which was really helpful to us, and it really 
made us a part of the community. So eventually I, I was initiated in, into a, well, I wasn't so in, much initiated, but I was just adopted into a clan. It's really safe to adopt males because we don't inherit anything. <laughs> in, in Hopi culture, it's all inherited through the women. So they could do anything. They, I could become, you know, king of Walpi, but I don't have any descendants to, to pass that on to because, uh, you know, it, it would be uh, through uh, a Pueblo woman that I was married to. Um, so, um, and if anybody has any questions along the way, uh, you can ask them, but I'll, uh, certainly we can, we'll cover a lot of things afterwards. Um, so, lessons from the, the project that, that I learned. Um, uh, one of the things, I grew up in the 70s uh, in archaeology, the 60s and 70s, and that was called the New Archaeology. That was a period of the New Archaeology, which now is not so new anymore. It's, it's, uh, but the new archaeology, uh, it, had, it had some very um, useful um, practices, but the new archaeology uh, was very uh, hypothesis driven and very quantitatively driven uh, and tended to, to lose the people in the study of archaeology. We were more concerned, I did a whole dissertation on this that I hope none of you ever read, but uh, <laughs> uh, where, where we really look at patterns and artifacts and we kind of forgot about the people behind the artifacts in, in a lot of the work that we did in that period. Um, so for me, this was a, a perfect way to connect me back to with, these are people that produce these objects, you know, and it seems pretty obvious, but as an archeologist, you're out there digging around and you're finding stuff, sometimes you forget about the, the context and the people and the people that are behind this. So that was important for me. Um, and the thing that was probably most valuable for, in my work at Walpi was understanding the social and ceremonial context of where artifacts are used and how they are used to negotiate all sorts of things between people. The, context of, of looking at a community and where objects are used um, is something that I have taken with me for the, I've been at the University of Arizona for 30 years now, and uh, it has allowed me to think about the archaeological record probably in a different way than in many of my contemporaries, because I worked in a living archaeological site. That site Walpi had five families living in it when I was working there. So it was basically abandoned. Uh, yet all the objects and all the rooms and everything were still intact. And then I could, you know, I could talk to people about those things. Um, so we find, in, in, as I move forward, I, I, my, the project I've directed for much of the last 30 years is what's called the Homolavi Research Program. And there's... Uh, um, Archaeology Southwest is kind enough to bring copies of the um, handout there that, that describes the work that we did, were doing. This is 14 years ago. But this was the perfect opportunity for me because working at the Hamolovi sites near Winslow, um, I'm working in basically Pueblo communities that are the same size or even larger than Walpi. They just happen to be about 500, 600 years older. But when I, when I work in the communities at Wallaby, they look very, very familiar to me because they basically are structured, organized, inhabited, and abandoned in the same way that Walpi was being abandoned. So it allows me to have a better understanding of when we get into a structure full of objects and deposits and things like that, why it's that way. So there's a room that we excavated at Walpi, and it was, uh, it's what's called a religious storage room, something that I didn't even know existed <laughs> until I started working at Walpi. Well, of course, you know, if you have religious objects, you're gonna have to store them somewhere. 
You just can't leave them in the kiva all the time because they would be in the way. So you have to have a place to store them. So right next to the most important kiva uh, at Walpi was this uh, ceremonial structure. And, uh, to, and to get into the structures, um, the religious leader for that area made us bathe ourselves in an emetic and to take uh, uh, a potion that he created to, dr to drink to protect us from the potential uh, negative forces the, the, from some of the activities that took place in those structures in the late 1600s and early 1700s, which they still remembered in 1975. So there's that whole social memory, that whole memory. You can talk to the religious leaders at Walpi in 1975, and they knew what happened in the village and what, where things were that hadn't been used in hundreds of years. They re, it's important to remember those things. So we, when we went into this area, we had to take all these um, potions and, and cover our skin with these protective uh, potion so that we wouldn't be, so that ghosts or whatever um, beings might be in those structures would not harm us. And um, we were told that we would find some very important religious objects in this, uh, in this structure. So when we uh, started working in it, we did find all kinds of really amazing objects in there. But a lot of the things we found were um, everyday objects, pottery, grinding stones, um, materials such as that, um, that were used for ceremonial activities, for storing certain objects in, in terms of the pottery, um, for uh, perhaps keeping snakes or something in. Um, but they look like everyday objects. And so in the archaeological record at Homolavi, we find structures that look a lot like this structure where we will excavate through some very complex deposits and we'll find whole objects in, in the fills of these rooms that have been placed there uh, either to discard because they're no longer being used or to store over a long period of time. And oftentimes these structures are ceremonial structures or adjacent to kivas or things like that. So they're the same sorts of practices that are going on. Um, so one of the, the things that every archaeological site has in common is that it was abandoned or depopulated. That's why it's an archaeological site. Nobody's living there anymore. And so one of the things, we have, we have a great uh, amount of literature out there about people migrating into communities. The big the Four Corners area was abandoned and everybody migrated down into other communities. One of the communities they moved into or the communities they moved into are the Homolavi sites. Uh, but not a lot of archeologists focus so much on how sites are depopulated, how people leave communities and how that impacts the construction of the archeological record. And that's what we find as archeologists typically is we find how people closed or left their villages. Oftentimes, not how they were living in them, but how they stopped living in them. And uh, so the work at Walpi allowed me to see many structures that hadn't been used for a long time that, that were um, full of important objects, but those objects were known about, but they were never going to be used again. And there were structures uh, in, in these communities that people knew exactly who lived there 100 years ago. Uh, who they were related to, who their descendants are. It's, you know, it's not particularly different maybe from our own society. But all this memory is stored in these places. And then when that place is no longer used, a lot of that memorabilia gets put into those places in these Pueblo communities. So that's what, we've, that's what we're finding a lot in the archaeological record at these Homolavi sites, is we're finding areas that are absolutely full of objects and things that are being placed in there that are basically ways of closing or ending the, what we call the life of these structures and the lives of these communities. We're finding all these deposits and dedicatory things in these areas that people really haven't thought a lot about as archeologists in the past. Um, 
I'll just give you uh, one example, and then I think we're probably, oh gosh, we're, oh, have I been talking half an hour? See, I'm a, I'm a professor, so, you know, it's, I love talking. Um, but I sometimes realize people who are listening to me don't love it as much as I do. But uh, I, I just, uh, uh, doctoral student of mine and I just published a paper where we examined the use of ash in deposits and structures. Now, you know, ash is in hearths and ash is in all sorts of places. Um, at Hopi, um, there is something called the new fire ceremony in November where they empty all the hearths of all the ash uh, in the community and they take that and they discard it in a certain area. Uh, but ash is also used, uh, especially juniper ash and sage ash to some degree, as a purification emic. Uh, there's a lot of um, ceremonies today, in New Age ceremonies, where they burn juniper and, ash, and sage to go around and, and cleanse areas. Uh, that's, that, that's used at Hopi today, and we find it used over and over and over again in these uh, deposits at Homolavi, where they are using ash to close an area after it's being used. The deep deposit of ash, uh, and it's often over deposits that probably were considered somewhat dangerous. Just like the rooms that we went into, we had to take the emetics and things like, because they were dangerous. There are areas in every Pueblo that are dangerous to other members of the community because they haven't been initiated into the societies that know how to use those areas and the objects in them. So to protect other people in the community, they seal them with ash or they burn the structures down. So we see a lot of burning in these communities, but it's very targeted burning. They're not burning everything. They're burning some ceremonial structures. They'll burn a structure here and there. And almost always the structures that are burned, there's all kinds of rich deposits underneath them full of really amazing, interesting objects. So, um, and I want to just quickly point out that uh, one of my uh, graduate students, Saul Hedquist, hiding way in the back, he is doing a really interesting project looking at turquoise and how turquoise circulates in a very large area of the Pueblo South west, uh, coming from long distances, and where that turquoise ends up in the archaeological record. Uh, you can imagine turquoise is fairly valuable, so you're going to be very thoughtful for the most part about what you do with something when you discard it. And then the final thing that I'll just say is that the archaeological record that we find is pr almost all constructed by the people in a thoughtful, purposeful way. So when we talk about middens and trash and things like that in these structures, yeah, we find them in there, uh, you know, that, that, that things that look like they're just trash and, and, and midden-like materials. But when we really examine those, we find that there's a lot of structure to those that as archaeologists in the past we didn't really appreciate. That they're forming, they're putting deposits and objects in almost every structure with a, a purpose. And so that's, that's what I focus a lot on is deposit-oriented archaeology, looking at every deposit and looking at the meaning of it. And because almost everyone does have a meaning. So let's see, is there anything else? Um, oh, yeah, I, I would just say that um, um, you know, I started working with uh, Hopi people in 1975, and I continue to have a uh, a working relationship with the Hopi tribe and many tribal members. And it is always such a great uh, privilege when they come out and visit because they always impart wisdom and knowledge uh, to uh, share with students and to share with me about what we're looking at and where we're working. So uh, it's so beneficial to work with uh, indigenous groups, especially ones that help create the archeological record you're working in. Believe it or not, they have some insights and knowledge that we haven't thought of as archaeologists, and we need to listen to them. So, uh, thank you.
So I have the microphone, and I've, I'll bring it around for anyone who has a question. You had mentioned the religious storage rooms that were being having a lot of ash laid over the top of things. Does this mean that the objects below the ash had been previously backfilled or covered over with something else, or was the ash filtering down into the deposits? There are actually four different patterns of ash that we found, but uh, um, I'll send you the article. Uh, <laughs> the, 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 the thing that I was referring to is, uh, for instance, uh, I'll give an example. Uh, and we, we excavated um, a kiva in the village of Chevlon, uh, which dates, the kiva probably dates, was built about 1300 and occupied for 75 years or so. When they stopped using that kiva, um, they began to, the roof was still intact, they began to f put objects through that roof onto the kiva floor, burying the floor. And uh, most of those objects were used, had some ceremonial intent. Uh, we, we found a lot of very un rare and unusual objects, uh, birds, uh, bighorn sheep, all kinds of things are being put into. So they systematically put all of these objects in, into that, that uh, through the hatch of that roof onto the floor, um, filling it up about this high. And then when they were done with that, they dumped a huge amount of ash over the top of it to close and seal it off. So, and that that's, happens very frequently. Sure. Um, I have. Two questions, please, over here. Okay. <laughs> um, one of them is the religious or ceremonial objects that you find in Homolovy now when you're um, digging it up, how do you deal with them? Do they go back to the tribe? Do you use some of the people in the tribe in order to figure out what to do with them? Um. And the second question oh, so, is, yeah. do you think, you talked about trash mm -hmm. and the so-called trash heaps or whatever, um, and how actually they're a lot more purposefully stored. And I'm just wondering whether it's our attitude about trash that helped form this maybe wrong idea about what we're finding, that because you know, we dump trash heaps everywhere, whether right. other people who had a lot less stuff than we do didn't really generate that much trash to begin with. Right, yeah, those are good questions. Uh, the first question having to do with the uh, objects that um, have a ceremonial, uh, a ceremonial role. Uh, one of the things I learned when I was at Walpi um, from, um, various of the religious practitioners up there, is that objects of religious objects, many of them are de decommissioned, basically. They're replaced, they wear out, and they're replaced. This is something that we call ceremonial trash, where something is worn out and it's discarded. Um, so uh, a lot of the material that we find is just basically worn out and discarded, it, 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 and it has no value or interest um, to uh, current um, descendants of Hopi. Um, all, the, all the materials that we collect, uh, because uh, all the sites we're working on are on state land, all of that material is at the Arizona State Museum. Um, we meet periodically with the Hopi Culture Preservation Office and talk about the research we're doing. We invite people to come down, see what we're doing. And then our collections are always open and accessible in Tucson whenever somebody comes down, if they want to look through them. Uh, so that's, that's the way we handle it. We, we, we leave it open. Um, we really haven't had anything that uh, ha has been a concern. Um, I think primarily for the reason I mentioned beforehand, because it's, it's potency is no longer a, an issue today. But that doesn't mean that it won't happen in the future. Uh, with respect to your um, second question, uh, I, th I think that you're exactly right. One of the things that I learned and I, I should have mentioned 
um, is that I learned to think about um, the, the past in archaeology in a non-Western way. Uh, I, you know, although it constantly comes back and clouds and confuses me, um, but that's a really important thing, lesson that I learned is that, that there's a, a world out there that, that is different and can't be explained by just scientific methods. Uh, I'll, I'll tell one quick story. Um, I'll take up a couple of your time of your questions. Um, there's, there are night ceremonies up at Hopi um, in, in, the, in the spring, late winter and spring. Um, there's one that's called the Bean Dance Puam, Puamugi. And um, it starts at 11 p.m. So uh, there were a group of us waiting to get into this kiva on the top of, of, Wal of, of First Mesa. And we were um, you know, just hanging out, talking to each other. And suddenly there was this commotion and everybody said, come look, quickly look. And so we looked off over towards Second Mason. There were these uh, three huge fires that were burning, just huge fires. And we thought, oh my gosh, you know, somebody set, you know, Sinopavi on, on fire or the fields or something. And, uh, and as soon as we noticed them, they went out just like that. And, uh, and then about two or three minutes later, uh, in another area, these fires, huge fires, showed up on the landscape uh, 10 or 15 miles away. And this happened one more time. Um, so after, after the, the, the night and we went, the, all the ceremonies were finished, a bunch of us went out to find where these fires were. There was no trace of any fire anywhere. Uh, the... Uh, the caretaker of this world, this fourth world, is a, a being who Hopi call Masao. Masao has, has allowed the Hopi and everybody living here to live here if they follow the rules. That is to take care of Mother Earth. And one of the signs of Masao is fire. He's a fire god, he's a god of death. Uh, he has many roles. But one of them is fire. So the Hopi interpreted that, and I'm not going to dispute them, as that Masao was checking things out and showing a little concern about how we were treating uh, the earth. Uh, you know, there were probably 40 of us that saw these fires. So uh, we, I, we, none of us had been drinking. There were no drugs involved. <laughs> yeah. So, so that gets to the point of, you know, there are things out there that can't be explained and they just have to accept. And, and that, that is an important part of looking at the archeological record, realizing that, you know, it can be organized and structured in a way that we may not see if we look at it in the scientific, this, this way that we're used to looking at it. We need to look at it in different ways. And so a lot of the students that I work with um, are doing that kind of work. They're looking at things in different ways and that's a really important Thing. So the, the concept of trash uh, that is, you see in the archaeological record, yeah, you know, that, that Pueblo people, um, you know, in the Four Corners region are buried in trash is what is often said. But they didn't think of it as trash, you know, that's where they, that's where things that were used up went. When people died, their, their bodies were used up and so they were put there with the other used up things. But the person, you know, they're not, they're not, don't matter anymore, they, they certainly matter. So anyway, that was a kind of a long answer, thank you. Yes. As you suggested, Native Americans are rightly concerned about outsiders coming in and digging up their artifacts. In the last couple of three days, representatives from the Navajo and Hopi tribes with a sum of money raised for the purpose went to, I believe it was Paris, to buy back uh, uh, ceremonial artifacts which were up for auction uh, there uh, in, in France. Do you know anything about the provenance of those objects or any more about that story? Um, I know a little bit more about it. It was, it was, hope, it was the, the part I know was Hopi artifacts. I don't know of any Navajo artifacts and they were Kachina friends or masks. Uh, there were two different auctions. 
One in, um, I think, in March or April of 2013 that involved about, I think, 80 objects, and another one in the fall, November, December of last year. Um, and those were stolen um, by um, more than likely Hopi people who had knowledge of where these things were. They have a great deal of value, and then they were sold to somebody who was offering them money to do this. Um, and the, uh, uh, the Hopi uh, asked the Paris courts to stop this, but uh, under, Par uh, under uh, French law, they had no mechanism to do that. Um, be and my understanding is because, the, uh, because they had been owned and purchased by, other, by people, that these, th th these kachinas were now, were now commodities in, in the eyes of French courts. And so they were no longer religious objects because of that. Um, 21, I think, of the 23 kachinas that were sold in the last auction were purchased uh, and returned to the Hopi people. Uh, so that was a successful sale. But the Hopi are, and this is an alert for all native tribes, to begin to understand that there are other court systems and things and to begin to find ways through their lawyers and, and communicating with these other countries to find ways to stop these in the future because it will certainly continue to go on. So that's, that's pretty much my knowledge of it. I just read recently that the Navajo tribe managed to buy back its things within the last few days. Oh, good. So they did that. I didn't realize Hopi had. But the question I had was... Uh, well, you, the Hopi didn't buy them back, but they had... They a, had some help. Yeah, yeah. But uh, revert, reverting back to the uh, storage rooms with layers of ash and artifacts, does this relate in any way to the, I believe it was sent, uh, Mesoamerica, Mexican con thing of... Um, Renewing each temple every 52 years. Did they do anything of that nature, a certain period where they renewed everything? Did Hopis do that? No. No, no okay. we don't have anything in uh, the Southwest archeological record where they, what, that's called kind of termination ritual where mm -hmm. everything is basically destroyed. Mm -hmm. um, the closest thing to it is that annual thing that they do where they clean out all the horrors and things like okay. that. And they have that, that's an annual renewal. Okay, thank you. Uh, my question. Uh, did Walpi participate in the raising of Wadavi? And if so, can you talk about that a little bit? Uh, sure. Um, the event he's referring to is um, in... Um, Yeah, I think they are. Oh, is it working again? Yeah. Okay, maybe it's just where I put my butt. Maybe that's it. There we go. Yeah, that's where I put my butt. Okay. I, will, I won't move. Um, so I mentioned in 1680, many of you know, there was the Pueblo Revolt, um, where the three missions were destroyed at the Hopi Mesas. Um, the most um, mission, missionized village was the village of Awadavi, which is uh, actually east of the three Hopi mesas. It's called, it's called Antelope Mesa. It's the largest, most complex uh, village of its time. Um, the missionized community of Hopi at Awadavi in 1699 invited the missionaries at the Zuni mission uh, which had been remissionized when the Spaniards came back to come over and consecrate the new mission, a new mission at Awadavi. Um, the chief, as the oral tradition goes of Awadavi, um, was not happy that the, this is why they, you know, killed the missionaries. They wanted the Catholic religion back and they were trying to bring it back. And so he invited the uh, other villages, uh, secretly, other Hopi villages, to come and destroy Awadavi because he felt it was permanently stained and that basically had to be destroyed to start over. Um, so people from uh, the village of Walpi did participate in that. Um, and there were also uh, people from Second and Third Mesa that participated in it. 
uh, that the story goes uh, in 1700, the chief uh, held a ceremony. All the men were in the kivas um, getting ready for the ceremony, and then that's when the village was attacked. Um, they threw chilies down into the kiva and then closed them off, and, and the men died. And then the women and children who were left were taken and divided up among the remaining uh, villages. So at a, Walpi, for instance, there are clans from Awadabi that know they're from Awadabi and remember that, and they still are recognized as having ownership of farmlands and other things over in that area. Uh, but the, the village will never be occupied again or used again because of the, the events that happened there. I have the um, microphone over here. Uh, when you talked about the ash over the ceremonial objects, I must have misunderstood. Is this, are these objects now that you are um, excavating and then you're putting them into the Arizona State Museum? It sounded like they were religious items and why would, my second question or part of that question I guess is, how, why would the Hopi allow you to excavate them if this is how they, um, you know, had sealed them? Um, well, the, um, as I had answered a little bit previously, these objects have been looked at the Hopi, by Hopi, and they have been viewed as basically decommissioned. Um, the Hopi have, res have supported the research that I've done uh, in, in what is now Homolovy State Park uh, as a way of, first of all, proving that those were uh, Hopi communities, so that was important to them. Um, also, the Hopi are very interested in their history and their past, and so they feel the work that we're doing is helping to uncover that history and past. Um, to, uh, there are many things we found at the Homolovy sites that Hopi leaders were really surprised to find out about and um, learned from the archaeological work we were doing as a result of that. Um, the, um, the objects that we find, you know, ash is used in many different areas in these sites. They're used, they're used to close areas, to seal them off, uh, to, to, to basically turn, to end the activities that are taking place in those structures. The objects underneath them are, for the most part, used up. Anything that is, is an active, vibrant part of a community, when it is being left, is taken with those people. So all the objects uh, that were at Homolovy we, that have... Uh, uh, current, had current power and importance to the people living there were taken with them. The things that no longer had that were left. Uh, but the objects in some of those structures they felt at the time, that's our, that's our interpretation, um, might have had some um, potency and danger to people in the community at the time. So uh, the Hopi people today do not feel that that is an issue any longer. Um, that these objects, because of their age and because they've been replaced, no longer have that power and potence. And so, uh, but back then, 600 years ago, they did. I really appreciate your story about how you were able to get the Hopi to understand that science helps them to understand their own history. This is, uh, um, uh, as opposed to other incidents such, such as the Kennewick Man incident in which there was a, a major battle between their Native American tribe and the science that was used to, de you know, to uh, right. determine that case. Uh, a few years ago there was a geneticist, uh, I believe his name was Spencer Wells, who uh, travels the world um, collecting DNA samples from ethnic groups around the world to tell the, the history of our species. And I believe it was he who collected, when he collected DNA samples from the Navajos and uh, 
went back to tell them about the history of their uh, the, the history of their tribe, he had some difficulty with the Navajos because the science said something that clashed with the traditions, traditional story of where the uh, Navajos came from. So the fact that you were successful in using science to uh, promote the Ho Hopi's uh, history is uh, a really great thing to hear. Thanks. Chuck, while I'm heading that way, um, you obviously spent a great deal of your uh, career in the field there at uh, Walpi, and at the end of that uh, heavy investment of your uh, professional effort, um, you were not able to publish completely uh, what you had been studying. Right. How have you dealt with that in terms of professionally, and uh, are there any further comments you want to make on that aspect of sure. working with Hopi? Um, well, after the heavy drinking binges and the antidepressants, uh, <laughs> pulled myself up. Uh, um, yeah, thanks, Bill. Uh, the, yeah, the, the, result, the results of the work that we did up there, um, I, I talked about the field work. Uh, one, one of the important um, events that took place, uh, I uh, described originally that people were very sus suspicious and that we were going to take these artifacts back to uh, the museum or maybe sell them. Um, after we'd been in the field for 18 months, just before we finished the project, I went to the, uh, the Hopi religious leaders at Walpi and then the tribal council um, for the, all the Hopi communities and asked them if we, they would loan us the artifacts so that we could finish the analysis work we, we excavated 250,000 artifacts. Uh, we couldn't get those analyzed <laughs> while we were working full time. So we asked if we could take them back so that we can complete the analysis. Uh, and because of the trust that we had created with these communities and the tribe, they gave us permission to do that. Uh, and the material ironically is still there because they don't have any place to house it up at Hopi. So until they do, it's, it stays at the museum. Uh, but as a result of that, we got some other grants um, to finish the analysis. Uh, we produced an eight volume set uh, on the analysis of all the Walpi material um, published between 1979 and 1982. And then I did this synthetic volume um, in 1983, which was funded by the National Endowment for the Humanities. Um, none of those, however, were allowed to be published because uh, between the time we left in 77 and, and 82 and 83, when we wanted to try to publish this, most of the religious leaders at Walpi had either retired or died and they had been replaced by new religious leaders who didn't know me. And they didn't, they were distrustful that we were going to publish something that would be, you know, religious. You know, they were, they were uncertain of their own authority because they were new and they just were afraid they would be under my, make a bad decision and then be ostracized by the community. Um, I had a book deal <laughs> to publish that. Um, but um, it was more important for me to honor, and, and, I, and I had a contract, I could have wiggled my way into publishing that legally, um, but I felt it was more important to honor the wishes of the, of the people there um, with the hope that sometime in the future, maybe some of this would come out. Uh, I'm working on a, a monograph now which, where we'll pub be able to publish the work from Walpi on the ceramics that we did. Um, one monograph has been published on the basketry, but most of it hasn't been published. Um, and that's, that's just the way it is sometimes. But because of the relationship that I had with Hopi and, the, and the, the trust that I developed with them, actually turned into my being offered the job I have at the Arizona State Museum, the University of Arizona, because of the relationship, working at the Mullaby sites, uh, I, they wanted to hire me because I was already successfully working with the descendants of that. So it worked out. 
I would probably wouldn't have had my job if I had to ram through that publication and run around, you know, the SAA meetings going, look, I published a book. And I might be washing dishes somewhere with a PhD. <laughs> but uh, but that's, that's one of the things that happens. Um, you know, when you're a young scholar, you're very concerned about having things to demonstrate you're actually doing something. When you lose three or four years of that effort, there's almost nothing to come out of it. I did have an American Antiquity article come out, but you know, you worry about your, your career, you know, what's going to happen because it's just this big black hole. But fortunately, it's such a small community, you know, people really know what you're doing as it turns out. You know, I, I, I wasn't, I was, people were paying attention. Ray Thompson was anyway. <laughs> well, I think I just, part of the reason to ask that is just to show the level of integrity that this man has and the way he's built that relationship. So um, we're very impressed with uh, that kind of uh, behavior. So thank you, thank thank you, you for Bill. On the stabilization of uh, Walpi, uh -huh. um, did, you had Hopi workmen, and did you go in and use traditional methods, sort of, or did you use rebar and you know concrete and things? Uh, I uh -huh. mean, you did a wonderful job because well, I mean well, it looks like you. a his, you know historic village. Yeah, um, <laughs> the the stabilization work. Um, I, I was there to advise, but it was actually being run by a couple of people from the Bureau of Indian Affairs. Um, and so for the, what the goal of that, the goal of the stabilization project for the most part was to, um, uh, try to preserve the existing walls that were there because if, if you tore them down, you'd, you know, that, that the integrity of that structure would be lost. So the solution they came up with is they built an interior wall to that wall and then tied it into that um, using concrete and, and, and rebar and wires and things like that to, to provide a support behind it. And then you, oftentimes we did the, redid the roof um, and put, um, rather than rebuilding it the way it was, they made the decision to put lightweight concrete on the roof, but to use the original materials in the roof. So when you look at it, it looks original. Uh, and the reason that was done is because they hadn't been taking care of it and there was no indication they were going to continue, ever take care of it. So it was built uh, in a way that it didn't need really much upkeep. Uh, so that was mostly what, what was done. In a few instances, walls were rebuilt. And one of the unfortunate things is that the, the people, we hired people who were masons, <laughs> but they were masons. You know, so they, they, they didn't know how to work with something that wasn't exactly the same. So they, when they, we went out and got raw material, rock and sandstone to build it, they, you know, they cleaved out stones that looked, all looked exactly the same. And they were huge and they were nice and even. And they brought those back and I said, you can't use those. Those don't look anything alike the old stuff, you know, and so we battled with these Hopi Masons and trying to get them not to be Masons, you know. Uh, they were very good at it, but it, it resulted in not very attractive walls. So that's, how, that's mostly how we, we dealt with it. Um, we didn't use any original materials like clay or our, tr our treated clay. We basically used concrete because you know, the village is closed now. Nobody can get in and repair it, and it and it just wouldn't be standing if we hadn't done it with the way of permanency, looking at it that way. So on the outside, it looks great. On the inside, we plastered over. Oftentimes, it was cinder block. <laughs> if you go inside, you'd be appalled by what you saw inside. But the Hopi were very happy with it, and that's really what counted. They're the ones that we had to satisfy. They were our clients. So, is there one more question? Chuck, thank you very much. This has been You're a welcome. great. You're welcome. Thank you. Thanks.